The Boisselot piano, which we copied, is 1846, and it was <clears throat> delivered to Odessa for Liszt's last tour as a piano performer. Uh, because on this tour, he wound up eventually in Kiev, and there he met Karolin Susan Wittgenstein, uh, who asked him why he drank so much. And he said, well, actually, I hate touring. And she had the very good idea uh, that they would <clears throat> uh, abscond together to Weimar. She would leave her Russian noble husband, bring her daughter, and with Liszt, they would occupy the Villa Altenburg in Weimar, which she had, the three front rooms she had painted differently. There was a red room, there was a white room, and there was a blue room. Hers was the blue room. <clears throat> Her daughter's, the daughter Russian princess, had the white room. And the red room went to Liszt. Of course, this red, white, and blue are Russian colors, so that's, that's how it worked. <clears throat> he, however, put his Boisselo instrument at Mindenesville, Altenburg, he put it in an upstairs uh, back room in, in an annex to the building. And that was a, not a very big room, but that's where he practiced and where he composed and where he used his Boisselo, and of which he wrote in 1861, he wrote to the surviving brother of Louis Constantin Boisselo, to the composer Xavier Boisselo, he wrote, I still have the piano your brother made for me 15 years ago, and though I have nearly played through the keys, uh, <clears throat> I love it. It is still my daily partner in my struggles with music of the past, present, and future. And I'll never get rid of it. Uh, that was very charming to say. What it means is that it, the, the, that piano with the Boisselot was integral to his composition from the period 1847 to 1861. And <clears throat> there was an awful lot of music written in that period by Liszt. And the... Uh, of course, in the next year, 1862, he got a Beckstein, but that's another story. But he was very faithful in his long, uh, long association with the piano builder Boisselot, whom he met in Paris in 1825 when they were both teenagers. Uh, they were the same age, and Boisselot was sent to Paris from Marseille by his music publisher family to learn piano building. And who did he meet immediately but Franz Liszt? So there is a, a distinct Listian quality in the proportions of the instrument Boisselot built, always with Liszt in his mind. He had a child, did, did Boisselot, whom he named Franz. And Liszt was the godfather to this child. There's a very close connection for years and years. And Liszt, of course, played in Marseille at the Boisselot factory for the 100 workers gathered in the garden. And they toured Spain together, Boisselot and Liszt. And in Lisbon, at the end of this tour, <clears throat> Liszt left behind the Boisselot piano as a gift to the queen, who gave him a diamond-studded snuff box in compensation, which he valued very highly. So there is Liszt was nothing if not faithful to Boisselot, and he I think he writes with with meaning about the fact that he played through the keys. I've had the original; we copied the original, and this is a piano which belonged to one man and had a fifteen-year service life. This instrument. And he truly uh, 
played through the ivories. They're so much, so much worn. And the interesting thing is that they are worn in the same way that his traveling keyboard is worn, which I've also seen in Weimar. They are worn on the very fronts of the naturals which says something about hand position or his fingers were so long that his thumbs could only be on the absolute very front of the key. Who knows? But they were worn in a specific way. So something about his hand position. 